Hello, my name is Elizabeth Ford and I work for the Gangmasters Labour Abuse Authority and I've been asked to speak to you today about awareness around preventing rural exploitation. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work of the Gangmasters Labour Abuse Authority and to raise awareness within rural communities around that labour exploitation and really how organised criminality thrives in its use of vulnerable individuals. You have to ask yourself the question, does modern slavery exist in rural communities? Well, the sad fact is that modern slavery thrives in all its form in, a rural, in rural areas and that many businesses, farms, growers, pack houses are all reliant upon flexible seasonal labour. And it's a fact that because of the way rural businesses are located, they do not have the same public scrutiny that urban communities have. So I'm going to talk to you and give you an overview of the indicators or what we term the indicators, but more importantly, describe the methodology organised crime uses to exploit vulnerable people. This awareness and information given to you will increase your knowledge and it's to demonstrate to you that this crime of modern slavery is so nuanced, it's so difficult to pin down. And for that very reason, it's the popular choice, the go-to choice for organised criminality, and it's how they make their money. And if we can look at lots of different areas, we can look at how people are used for forced labour. It's how we can look, at they're used for sexual exploitation, in domestic servitude, the popular new crime of county lines and being aware of all that that involves. And do you have pop-up brothels? Indeed, what are pop-up brothels in your rural area? Where you have vulnerable people, you have the ability to make money out of them if you're an organised criminal. A little bit about the Gangmasters Labour Abuse Authority and who we are in the first place. Well, we're an arm's length body of the Home Office and we answer to the Home Secretary. We have a Director of Labour Market Enforcement and he sets our strategic direction. We look at a labour market at the moment of 10 million workers. When we first started, we were created by the then government in response to the tragedy at Morecambe Bay. And in 2004, 23 Chinese cockle pickers died shellfish gathering. It forced the government to take a more in-depth look at who, how and where our low-skilled labour was coming from. And it's a sobering thought to think that some of those deceased families, the, the deceased um, the families of the deceased workers, are still having to pay that initial work finding fee to organised criminal gangs in China. Organised crime gangs are far reaching. The GLA were given powers to prevent worker exploitation and protect vulnerable people in agriculture, horticulture, food packaging, processing and shellfish gathering, essentially the food and drink industry. And this sector had about 500,000 workers and we ensure compliance through a licensing scheme in this sector. We look at licensing and ensuring compliance around those who supply and use workers within the area. And the penalty on conviction for being an unlicensed gang master is up to 10 years imprisonment. Now, as I've said, we've had our powers and our remit expanded. We're looking at 10 million workers, which is a huge jump from 500,000. And we investigate through that mixture of compliance and enforcement and all our investigations are intelligence led and risk based. So what's our remit? Well, the remit of the GLA. Oh, God, I've gone far too far. I'll go back one. The re remit of the GLA is to protect vulnerable workers. We're going to be looking at targeting, targeting and dismantling and disrupting organised criminality. And we're looking to identify and tackle forced and bonded labour and human trafficking by licensed and unlicensed uh, gang masters. So what does modern slavery look like in the UK? Well, it's part 
of a huge global problem. There's no definition, old or young, adult or child, more so if you can't speak the language of the destination country, you are spun lies, loaded with debt. Essentially, you are a commodity. And where there is demand, and there always is, around low-skilled, high-demand labour, there's business to be done. Modern slavery can take many forms. And if you understand that one individual has the capacity to be used, and I do mean used like a commodity, in many different ways, essentially they're money-making machines for sex, domestic slavery, charging bogus fees amounting to debt bondage or forced labour. And particularly more so if you're a low-skilled worker and the list is endless. Well, we always say, what's the problem? Worldwide, the International Labour um, Labour Organisation reckon that we have over 40 million people, including children in modern slavery and in the UK. We have a working population in this country of about 31 million. And of those, it's thought 10.8 million work in high risk sectors. And construction is one of those. The most important fact on this slide is that these individuals provide the opportunity for multiple exploitation, easily swapping workers from one sector to another. And be mindful that your workers are not always exclusively employed within one particular sector. Asking extra questions for those of you that do employ workers in a rural com uh, a community. Are they tired? Have they got two jobs? The Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit estimate the statistics to be somewhere between 10,000 and 13,000 victims in the UK. But in actual fact, another again, I say it's a sobering thought, but this figure has been revised and it's understood to sit somewhere between 100,000 at the present time. And those figures are from the Walk Free charity. The most prevalent nationalities in the data collected from the Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Centre around our national referral mechanism. This is a framework that helps those individuals who've been identified as victims receive help and support is over 10,000 in the last recorded year of 2020. I'd like you to understand that many people do not want help. They just want to carry on working and actually get money to send home. And often when you say to people that they are victims, they don't consider themselves as such. So wherever you've got low paid, low skill, high demand, temporary labour, you're going to have the opportunity for multiple ex exploitation. The Modern Slavery Act of 2015 was passed into UK legislation, and we should be proud that we were the first country to have this legislation. But the three main elements I want you to concentrate upon is a definition. In conditions of exploitation, were they coerced into the job? This is a great opportunity for you. Sleep with my friend and the debt will go away. I promise you this job. But in reality, there is and there never has been any intention of placing the potential worker into the work that they've been told about. They were deceived, given false promises on what to expect and were forced either through threats and violence and the fear, which usually starts on arrival in the UK or in the accommodation. Up until this point, each and every potential victim believes the story that they've been told. And it's that hope that drives this crime. All the potential workers hope that what they have been, they've been told, they'll be able to work, they'll be able to get money, and they believe the stories and the lies that they've been told to coerce and deceive them. This government takes modern slavery so seriously, so much so that the penalty is life imprisonment, and this case means eligible for parole or early release after a period set by a judge and the minimum term is 15 years. Modern slavery, is it a myth or is it reality? Is it a myth or reality it doesn't happen in the UK and only in the shadow economy? Victims are always held under lock and key. But the reality is, it is in supply chains here. It introduces criminality into businesses 
and it's a significant source of income for the exploiter. It's all about the money that can be made. And with this slide, people are only ever trafficked for financial gain because it's high profit and low risk. Well, mainly because people are reluctant to speak out. They're frightened. They're sometimes ashamed to speak out. And they're easily replaceable. In my past life, before I joined the GLAA, I was a police officer. And I can say this with some confidence that it was very clear when somebody told us that there was going to be a car parked up in the early hours of the morning and that car would have drugs in the boot of the vehicle. The relevant officers would be delivered, uh, be deployed, given instructions. The car would be searched, the drugs removed and the perpetrators arrested and dealt with. That would be the end of that transaction. And the same goes for information about a vehicle that would be carrying firearms. The vehicle would be stopped by the appropriately uh, trained armed police officers. They'd secure the scene, the guns decommissioned and the bad guys dealt with. End of that transaction. But what about the minibus travelling to work at six in the morning with 14 workers on board? Would that vehicle be stopped? Well, it's highly unlikely unless intelligence had been received to the contrary. But remember, each and every one of those workers provides a gang master with the opportunity to exploit in so many different ways. It's about the demand for labour. Where there is labour required, there's a black economy. Where there's a black economy, there's lack of controls. If the subcontracting chain is complex and very lengthy. Compliant businesses are vehicles in which individuals can be placed who can conduct black market business without interruption unless the right mechanisms are put into place. There will be no doubt that Brexit will have an impact on the rural economy and the workforce. Hitherto relied upon, we rely upon the EU it's no longer accessible in the numbers that we previously enjoyed. And approximately 80,000 seasonal workers are employed or have been employed in British fruit, vegetable and flower, flower farms annually. The government has now reintroduced the SOAR scheme or the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Scheme. And the quotas available have now increased from 2,500 to 30,000 with four main agency providers. Well, you don't have to be a mathematician to understand that there's a shortfall. The work is still there. The work still needs to be done and the demand hasn't gone away. And I know that businesses tell us that relying on local employment has been very difficult, if not almost impossible to get work done. With a squeeze on labour, the work and the quotas still have to be met and there will be an upswing, a natural upswing in criminal exploitation. Well, what are the different types of exploitation? Well, there's broad categories linked to modern slavery and they all prioritise profit over people. Even the human body can be broken into parts to be, make money and organ harvesting, providing enormous amounts of income in different parts of the world. Think about how difficult it is for someone who's in domestic servitude, usually kept inside a house, their identification documents taken from them. And the only opportunity is when they are at a shop or maybe at church. Or think about seafarers on board a ship. Essentially, think of individuals as commodities because that's how they are viewed by organised criminality. So one person can be put to many different uses to work different jobs at different times. No good sitting around at home at night if you're not earning money. Often, if you're a woman, you can be used for sex as well as work. Now, I'm not here to talk about child exploitation in this arena, but you can imagine using this scenario that children are just viewed as the potential to make money, regardless of the damage and harm caused. With our emerging trends, nationalities generally exploit their own. However, we found a recent intelligence picture of increasing internationality exploitation of people prospects, 
post-Brexit to see an increase in labour from outside the EU so that employers have to check thoroughly identification documents and UK border staff are always happy to give advice. But what makes people vulnerable? Family debt, the need to find work, the inability to speak the language or to have good reading or writing skills. If you're homeless or you're destitute, you are often the target of traffickers. They will be attracted by the promise of work and accommodation. And with that promise, they have hope. And if they have mental health issues or substance misuse, then this also increases the vulnerability. Vulnerability among the homeless, as they can make individuals easy to coerce or control. One of my gang masters used to target prison drug rehabilitation centres, and mental health institutes to recruit his workers in Lithuania. Particularly if you're a convicted prisoner, you may find work far more difficult to come by in your home country, but you will be ripe for recruitment. Why is it such an easy crime for those seeking to exploit? Well, the methodology here is that you can offer work. The offer of work can be either via a friend, family, recruitment agency, acquaintance, stranger, smuggling agent, and the going rate can be anything from 250 to 1000 pounds for work for a work finding fee, dependent upon where you come from in the world. But no matter you must not worry. You can pay this back easily when you'll be earning good money in the UK. We'll look after you. We'll give you transport. And this is 110 euros if you're travelling from the EU, especially by road. But it's OK, we'll add this on and you can pay it back off in no time. And your accommodation, don't worry about it. We've got accommodation for you. It's no problem. We can put you in accommodation. And this is £120 up front for the two weeks deposit and will cost you £60 per week. Again, don't worry. This good job is a good job that pays well. But it does cost extra now we're in the UK and I know people in government. They can give you passes and you, of course, you have to pay for your national insurance number. That's £200. But don't worry because your work will pay this off in no time. And of course, this money that they've borrowed from the gang masters or the facilitators has got interest charged on it. And so you have to pay people another 10% per week. This methodology that I've just described is both simple and very effective. And I want you to think about the money that is being made here. And the end product is the money. And think about where that money is going. It's going to be used for more crime for drugs, guns, cybercrime, and that in turn, these crimes can af affect each and every one of us. And that vulnerability can come in so many different guises. I've just described to you extreme methods of recruitment, all of which happen in the UK. The low level scams can be just as lucrative. So if you work in a rural place setting, are you aware that people have to pay £10 a day for a shift? Because if you don't pay for the shift, you don't get work. That is just as lucrative as trying to scam people out of money any other ways. The scams and the lists are endless. This slide is entitled Hidden in Plain Sight. There's many different methods of recruitment. All have got a common thread of creating trust in those who seek to work. And the same methodology is used to control and the outcome is usually reliance from the worker and the hope. And the hope is always that this week, and as one of my victims said to me, I'll get my money. I just need to keep my head down. You can see on this slide, I've got uh, a picture of a car wash. If we go back not even five years, how many of us would have used the amount of car washes that are available? We used to have to pay quite hefty amounts to get our cars washed and valeted. And at the moment in the UK, we've got over 24,000 car washes and 19,000 of those are unregulated. We have information that a lot of these are run by Albanian nationals. 
And often workers here find themselves duped as they thought that they were coming for other types of work. Within car washes, they only get paid a small amount of cash at the end of the week. Often they're moved around from one site to another. And some victims report only being paid five pounds a day. Do you ever notice what they're wearing? Are they in jeans and t-shirts? And do they have appropriate footwear? With their feet being constantly wet, I was training this subject matter to an N to the NHS and a nurse came up to me afterwards and said that they were seeing increased cases of foot rot because of this, because people haven't got the appropriate footwear. When you go to use a car wash, do you only ever pay one individual, the same individual? And do the workers at the car wash change clothing? They don't accept because they don't accept it because they've uh, got a logo on the T-shirt so that it's all OK. Have a look. Is there a porter gabin or, a, or caravan temporary accommodation on site? Do those workers have eye contact with you? What's their demeanour? Do the staff change on site? Do they sleep in that porter gabin? Have a look at the site. What's the actual site like? Is it a bit tacky and a bit run down? And when you drive past at different times, are the same individuals always at work? There's a car wash app from the Clure Initiative. You can download for free and to report your concerns. And we've contributed to this project in the awareness. Street prostitution and sexual exploitation, young women, are told that they can pay off this work finding debt, the debt that I described to you earlier by sleeping with a friend. Increase in victims who find themselves homeless. Where do you think workers are being placed now with COVID? Homelessness is a natural end product to running away after having been exploited because they have nowhere else to go. And usually those that are controlling the accommodation control the worker. The illegal working sectors of cannabis cultivation, pickpocketing and prostitute. In the UK, we've got a wholesale market relating to the illegal selling of cannabis, and it's said to be worth about 2.6 billion a year and the possession of a class B drug up to five years imprisonment. Police estimate that when harvested four times a year, 25 cannabis plants, and that's probably enough to cover your average size kitchen table, can generate an annual, annual turnover of about £40,000. The vulnerable are forced to go to look after these plants, often being locked in, and think about where those profits go. So where best to place a cannabis farm? In a rural location, because it won't have passing footfall. It will be in an area that only those individuals can often get to. Profits from cannabis cultivation and pickpocketing are often recycled into the criminal economy for drugs and guns, as I've said beforehand. And an ex-colleague of mine in the Met said he was seeing pickpocketing on an industrial scale before COVID. Men and women forced into prostitution due to threats and fear and debt bondage. And this is where, as I mentioned earlier, the Modern Slavery Act provides a defence for those caught up in this exploitative behaviour. But it's the reason why many don't, don't speak up. I've put a slide up here for homelessness, not so much because of the homelessness in, in the rural community, but to explain to you in towns and cities, this is the end result. I've explained how people can be controlled by those seeking to exploit, and the majority of this is around the accommodation. And as I've said, whoever controls the accommodation controls the worker. So if for whatever reason someone leaves, and in many instances, we believe they become homeless for long or short periods of time, the reality is, as a government department, we don't really know. And the reason we don't know is because there's no effective method of sharing the information that we all have. And in order to change this, we need to have better data sharing, not just with government departments, but with charities. This would help us map and understand what's actually happening, because these very, very vulnerable people 
get re-trafficked. We've got a picture up here of the Rooney family, and I mentioned this case because you can find examples of other similar cases. Oftentimes people are exploited by traveller families and put into accommodation in a rural setting. Only people that live and work in these communities will be able to see movement of individuals and observe perhaps a slightly different viewpoint, having been made aware of the nature of the problem that you are the eyes and ears in this rural community. And the members of this traveller family were convicted for enslaving 18 men. They've been ordered to pay more than £1 million back under the Proceeds of Crime Act. And they were jailed, all of them, for periods between 10 and 15 years. They kept their victims on scraps. They were kept in squalor. They were forced to work for little or no pay, laying driveways for the family business. The Rooney family, Nottingham Crown Court, heard benefited by about £4 million. It's also heard that the majority of any money recovered would go to back to the victims. This family was an organised crime group, and we can be sure that this is a crime that is still going on today, and clients within the homeless sector are targets. So I say to you, if you're offered roofing or having your driveway done for a knockdown price, think Think twice about who's going to be doing this work and where your money will be going. I'd like to talk to you a bit about spotting the signs. Spotting the signs is always about appearance and demeanour. It's everything. And that reluctance to have eye contact, that reluctance to interact with somebody else, because often they're told stories that they are not allowed to interact or have contact with other people. They're told lots of lies about how they could be deported from the country when in actual fact they've got every right to be here. Do they continually look to another person or another individual before answering? The inability to speak English is what most organised criminals look for. Because if you can't communicate with someone, if you can't tell someone else what's happening, you can't tell somebody what's going wrong. And if you can't communicate, then you can't understand what your rights are. Oftentimes, access to ID documents are taken from individuals. When we have done um, operational cases, we actually find that most of the victims don't have any idea where their ID documents are. And oftentimes they're kept away from the premises that we've actually recovered victims from. The debt bondage becomes all encompassing. And again, as I said at the beginning of this, it's very nuanced. So if a worker is actually paying down a debt, they will find whatever reason for that work to stop. The compliant user will be happy with the worker. The worker themselves will be happy. But in order to make more money, they have to say, jobs no more, I'm taking you away, we'll get you another job. But it will be quite a few weeks before they can get another job. And of course, that debt starts to rise again. And with that debt, they have to pay another work finding fee for being moved. And if you can't speak the language and if you're being controlled and you're threatened, you are only understanding your world through the prism of what somebody is telling you. Oftentimes, transport is tied with the work and or the accommodation. Most of our workers find that they have to pay six pounds each way, but they don't have any choice as to whether to use the transport or not, or to stay in the accommodation or not. They have to stay there. Often these individuals will seem under the control of others, and then I take you back to demeanour. It's important to have a really good look at what's going on and banking and finances. When I first joined the GLA, um, workers were actually paid uh, by cash. And you can imagine uh, the scams that went on with that. We insisted in the GLA as part of our uh, compliance that workers had to have their own bank accounts. But of course, organised criminality is always one step ahead. And oftentimes these workers have been taken to open multiple bank accounts with somebody else interpreting for them. The banks have tightened up the, uh, on these scams. We found that they're having to try and pay this debt bondage bank. Some, some of our workers were found scavenging for food from food banks 
because if you haven't got money, you'll be forced to go to a place where there, where there is food. Accommodation in a rural location could be in caravans or tents. But when we find that people are put into accommodation, which is part of this overall control package, they're often in poor or substandard accommodation. Now, the reason for this is there's only one reason, and that's because it's cheap. They've got no choice who or where they live and who they live with. And as I've said earlier, whoever controls that accommodation in the exploitative process controls the worker. So at work, if you're living and working in a rural community, it's about looking at the colleagues that you work with who don't interact, who don't bring enough food for work occasionally. If they've got to wait for long periods of time before they're picked up from work. And if you are a, an employer in a rural community, what's your relationship with your agency provider? Is it very comfortable? Are you reliant upon individuals to interpret for you? Do individuals always have a ready supply of labour? And just ask that question, where do your workers come from? Using your eyes and ears in a rural setting, using your eyes and ears when you're out walking the dog, when you're at church, be aware of your fellow congregants. When you go to supermarkets, particularly on a Friday, which is payday, with groups of workers walking around together, being taken to a cash point all together. Have a look at what's in their basket. Is it very, very basic stuff? And all the workers have the same food stuff. But I mentioned this in all of this, in all of this, in all of your observation and what you're what you're going to put into practice by just understanding. Never, never, never put yourself in danger. It's about learning from what I've told you and observe and report it. The Clear Initiative have also written products along with the GLA of Help in Modern Slavery in Rural Areas. And this is their guide to spotting the signs. All of their products can be um, easily accessible online. And it's important to keep perspective because up and down the country, hundreds of compliant, well-run rural businesses, there's absolutely no exploitative um, behaviour going on. And if you have a compliant business that uses caravans to house migrant workforces, it does not mean they're all being used for modern slavery. But you may find groups of tents or people living away from the rural workplace being taken to and from work in cars. It's about looking for those nuanced signs. Do you see groups of people waiting in line for vans or cars and are they waiting to be recruited to work? Holiday cottages, do you have cars pulling up and leaving after short periods of time? Is there really too much traffic going into the premises, both in and out? And in, with regards to domestic servitude, oftentimes people come from a country where faith is really important to them. And so therefore going to church is perhaps their only opportunity to communicate with others, but for us, for others to communicate with them. Raising awareness, I want you to know there's no, no excuse now not to know that there's a risk. And when I train this subject to businesses, this is the slide that I want them to take away and understand. Because there's a potential for risk in their business and I want people to be vigilant. And for farmers, when your hired labour turns up on your site, I want you to think. I want you to think about how people have turned up on site, what connections they've got, where have your workers come from. And if you're using a recruitment agency to supply labour, look at your due diligence. Often people say, well, I don't know what's the problem. They've got all their documents and they're not being held against their will and they're free to leave at any time and they're here and they work willingly. But in actual fact, the one question everyone should be asking, is there vulnerability here? 
is there exploitation here? Because identifying that vulnerability and that exploitation is the key to unlocking this crime and safeguarding the vulnerable and exploited and for us prosecuting the guilty. I've put this slide up, which is the Clue of Farm Worker Welfare app. Uh, again, uh, this is accessible uh, with some of the products that the Clue have generated and it will give information to farmers and growers. It will give information to you of, if you're working in a rural um, setting. So you've got you've got to look at this as, as a whole. So it's really a tool so that workers are if they're not aware of their rights. If rural employers haven't got awareness training. We're still going to have rural employers that need to meet those quotas given to recruit and retain existing workers. And we understand now that many are not returning in the numbers that we've all previously enjoyed. And it's a potential now to have workers applying to work from different parts of the world. And I want you to be mindful of the penalties for employing um, an undocumented worker. This app gives you clear reporting mechanisms for workers. It gives you clear information. And finally, these are about some of our products that we can get uh, for you uh, that give workers information all in their own languages. There's posters available, which I find is probably the best, of me the best methodology. But finally, if you suspect someone could be a victim of modern slavery, Never, never, never try and take a formal story or a formal statement because this could jeopardise the evidence and put them in even more danger. Never, 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 and I speak with some experience here, make promises to any individuals and please never confront a person who you suspect to be a trafficker or controller. If you think someone is in danger, it's the same with any other crime. If someone's in immediate danger, you call 999. Otherwise, call 101 or the Modern Slavery Helpline on the 0800 number if you want to report a suspicion or concern. And make a note of anything that you think might be of interest to the authorities. And above all, it's about working together. There's obviously more information on this subject matter. And if you want to learn more, then you can contact the Gangmasters Labour Abuse Authority and you can ask for me. But finally, if you, as I said at the beginning of this session, we're an intelligence led organisation, which is a very grand way of asking people to tell us what's happening. But you do not have to give your name. And the Modern Slavery Helpline, you can report on this anonymously. But I would ask you, I'd ask you to do something. If you suspect someone is being treated in this way, do something rather than do nothing, because you could well be their only chance to get out of a really terrible situation. I hope that you found this product useful. And as I said, I'm available to help and give other advice if you need me to.